Hey everybody, let's talk about level design basics because uh, I think that people talk about it wrong. Let's say that you are building your very first game. It's an innovative title called Jumpman. This guy can break bricks with his head. What sort of levels are you going to build for him? Well, why not build some lava assets and make a, make a, a lava world with lava jumping puzzles, right? You do that and you call your friends over and you're like, hey, play this game I made. Tell me if it's any good. And they're like, um, yeah, I guess it, I guess it's okay. And you're like, oh, they didn't like it at all. Search YouTube, level design basics. Okay, well, here's a video that says I should use rising and falling tension. I can do that. And you do that and you bring a, your friends back. And they're like, yeah, you're really, really improving. You're really learning a lot. Yeah, okay, they hated that too. Search YouTube. Uh, okay, it says here that I should introduce a kind of mechanic and then let them do it and then replace it with a real test of that mechanic and let them do that for a while and then add in a third mechanic or whatever and then escalate the mechanic into a new thing. Let's do that. Let's do that. And they say, yeah, it's really coming along. Okay, they clearly are not being affected. Oh, let, let's just polish it. Let's add in some music and make make Jumpman a ninja with cool animations. And uh, and we'll f put fire on the ground. Fire, particle effect fire. Uh, what do you think? And like, oh, it looks, looks great. Nobody likes my level. Why doesn't anybody like my level? I looked up all those level design tutorials and... None of them helped. What's wrong? Well, what's wrong is that these aren't basics. These are level design polishing techniques. I don't know why so many basics videos list this sort of thing, because this is not what your level is. You can build any sort of palace you want, but if there's no foundation, it's just going to fall apart. And that's what's happening with our theoretical example. This is something that, of course, does get discussed. For example, the real reason why there are volcano levels uh, back in the original Mario, what they did is they said, okay, well, what sort of challenges can we give to Mario? I want a challenge. We've done a lot of challenges where you have to hit something from a specific angle, like the, the, the mushrooms, you stomp on them, or the bricks, you hit them from below. I want a challenge where if you hit it, you just die, no matter what. And we'll make it really challenging, and it'll be about moving through the level without ever intersecting with any of these weird moving barriers that will kill you. Oh, oh, that sounds good. Uh, okay, let's do it. What kind of theme should it have? Well, I think fire is good. We could use electricity or spikes or something, but fire tells the player that um, they will die if they hit it. So we'll do that, and then we'll just make it volcanoes and burning castles. Great. Love it. Print it. This is how it happens. The theme doesn't come first. It comes second. Or if it does come first, they really, really hammer down the play to make sure that it holds together. And this is true of everything, like their tropical levels, which are themed but make no sense. The theme doesn't fit the idea of falling donuts and seesaws. Those aren't really fundamentally tropical. But again, the theme comes second. The theme is more about polishing and skinning your idea. You need to have the idea first. Here's the problem. That's a platformer. And not to be insulting, but platformers are their own thing. We can't really extrapolate that very well, can we? I mean, if you've got an RPG, what kind of things would you do? I mean, would you have like, oh, this level's poison, and this level's like you fall down pits a lot, and like this level is you have to use holy things to kill off the bad guys? Whoa, that sounds incredibly obnoxious, and that's true. If you've ever played a mediocre RPG, one of the giveaways is that you enter in a swamp and everything poisons you. And you're like, oh, great. So I get to buy a hundred herbs because that's the only thing you can do. And it's just boring and stupid and annoying. Well, that's because these aren't really related to the core thing of RPGs. What is the core thing of RPGs? Because you know Mario isn't about jumping. We say that a lot. But Mario is about moving through space according to specific constraints. And those constraints change when Mario gets power-ups and stuff. And that's the core conceit here. So what is an RPG's core conceit? Well, it's actually exactly the same. 
Yeah, let's take a look at Final Fantasy 1. So this is Final Fantasy 1. Very, very rough, right? You start in Corneria, and there is the first dungeon up here. And the first dungeon looks a little bit like this. And you come in here, and the boss is here. What's the point of this map? Well, it's to get from A to B. Just like with Jumpman or Mario, the point is to get to the flag. You're trying to get to the boss. Well, it's not a test of skill exactly, is it? It's not like you have to jump at just the right time to get past to this forest and into the next clearing. No, instead what happens is you get fined. Every couple of steps you get in a fight and it costs you health and mana. And you know, it's easy at first, but as you get further away from the town, the fights get harder. And of course, as you start to approach the finish line, they get really hard. And that's the core conceit of a classic RPG. Some of the newer RPGs don't do this because um, they just heal you completely after every battle. But for a lot of older RPGs, this was the entire thing. The idea here is you have to get to the end, but how far can you get before it becomes too dangerous? Like, you get part way and then you turn around and come back and you power up, and then you get part way and you turn around and come back and power up and get part way, turn around and come back and power up. That is how RPGs always worked classically, and that's how most of them still do. Is this really like a core play? Is this is this what RPGs are about? Yeah, in the same way that Mario is about dodging obstacles as he moves through the level, RPGs are about paying for obstacles as you move through the level. Can you really use that to create the sort of compelling worlds and levels that Mario can do? What sort of tricks could you use? Well, it's actually not as hard as you might think. Let's talk about this. We want to go from A to B, but this door is locked, so we have to get a key. So we actually go over here and grab the key, and then we can go in the boss room. But maybe we're pretty badly injured, because this is costing us a lot of health just to be in this area. This is the high-density zone. So maybe we go and get the key, and then we go home. Well, you know what? Next time, we don't have to get the key. We can just go straight to the boss. This produces a little hiccup in the cost of this path. It's very similar to Mario jumping over uh, a, a pit or maybe taking a warp pipe. You short circuit the, st the standard calculus by creating a new path. And you know what? You can do this optionally. So like over here, there's something cool up here. Want to go see? Sure. There's a bridge. By the way, that's going to cost you a couple of encounters. And then you go back. And you don't have to go that way again. It's optional. Over here, hey, look, there's something down here. You want to go get it? Sure, but that's going to cost you some medium-grade encounters. Oh, okay. Well, how about over here? Sure, but that's going to cost you heavy encounters because that's up in the dangerous part. Do you have enough resources to go over there? Do you need to go back to town first? Do you need to go back to town after? It's all part of the calculus. And that's what RPG levels are about, about this calculus. But this is like saying that Mario is about jumping. It's, it's not that any given level is framed around this. Each level is framed around some specific idea within this framework. Can you create interesting, unique ideas within this framework? Well, sure, there's lots of approaches. For example, you could do a water tower sort of thing where you can go over here and you can do some lightweight encounters as you move along and then eventually you've got to fill this thing up with water at which point this goes away and you can't do it anymore but you can go over here and you can do another path that's more dense and you know it's basically just the same thing as finding a key and then getting a shortcut but you're creating this this, rep this repeating looping path situation and you can also go back if you want and change it back and maybe there's something over here and then you have to change it back, that is something you can do where you're just switching the level between versions. Or maybe you can do something where every time you get a treasure chest, the enemies get harder. So there's no enemies and you open the treasure chest and suddenly there's like skeletons. And it's not just something that only affects the future. It's not just there are now skeletons here. There are also skeletons behind you. And maybe if you actually go all the way back to the city, they actually go away. 
Okay, this is like just you in this current transit. And over here, you're like, I'm gonna gra grab a treasure. And oh, now there are, you know, vampires. And again, it's not just forward, it's also backwards. This is a theme that you could use. It's fairly straightforward to create this sort of idea. It's just that we're so used to thinking in terms of Mario because he's pioneered the path. But if you can stop and you can think about it in terms of your actual core play, whatever that might be, you can get a lot of fun ideas. And this sort of idea is compelling. Players will remember this dungeon where every time they looted a chest, they got more bandits coming after them or whatever it is. And you can theme it like, okay, well, they're, they're actually in... Um, they're, they're actually in a train and the bandits are jumping onto the train and every time they get treasure, the bandits see that and they see there's more treasure and they start to jump on the train in more and more numbers. Something like that, right? You can theme it, but the theme comes after you've created the core idea. Now, those ideas are really simple, right? How can we, how can we really, really bring this into a complicated modern game? Like, say, a Deus Ex game. Well, a Deus Ex game has builds. We're just going to stick with stealth and guns for now. We can talk about other ways to make this happen some other day, but we're just going to go ahead and say that you can build either for stealth or guns. Now, an ordinary path through the game, we'll call it the default path, would be the guns path. And you just go like this. There's the boss. You fight him. As with an RPG, you get into various encounters along the way. Now, with a pure RPG where you can return home, your encounters are going to ramp up as you get further from home, and it's going to be a natural instinct to return home, and that'll create that curve that we saw demonstrated. In an ordinary RPG, this is your turn, this is you returning home. But in something like Deus Ex, you may not be able to turn around and go home. You may have to keep pushing through, and if that's the case, you do have to create rising and falling action. You don't really have any other choices, because um, you need to have that in there. And if you're not getting it through the core gameplay, you're going to have to insert it yourself. So this is it. This is the the core path through the level. And yeah, sure, it winds through eight stories of, a, of an office building or something. But for demonstration purposes, we're going to draw it as a simple loop. So what sort of core conceits can you come up with? Well, we can do all of the ones we could do in an RPG, in an ordinary RPG, right? We could just go ahead and say like, uh, well, this, this gets harder if you loot the place because the guards get put on higher alert. And so now there are more guards. Uh, you could say, you know, there are, uh, that you have to switch the entire stage between several different settings by flooding and unflooding the aquatic base where all of the evil mutants live. So there are all of the same ideas, but how does that work with other character builds? Because obviously you don't want one level that's stealth and one level that's guns and one level that's tech. You want to have it so that uh, all of your levels have all of these builds in them and are all going to be viable for all builds and they're going to be fun in different ways but they all have to be able to interact with your core conceits. So if the level is about flooding and unflooding, you're going to want all of these people to be about flooding and unflooding, right? But does that really work? Because they don't have the same experience. A stealth adventurer might come in like this, and then they might get spotted here and rejoin the main. So if that's the case, well, they don't have any combat encounters at any point here. There's no combat encounters. There is only a combat encounter when they're finally spotted. Maybe they're spotted here, maybe they're spotted there, maybe they get to here, but at some point they get spotted and it becomes a combat encounter. Well, they've skipped a lot of the level, so their combat items are not terribly used. And the idea is the better you are at stealth, the less good you are at guns, and you can just get further along and then use the last bit of your guns to get to carry you the rest of the way and maybe it's not even stealth at the beginning maybe it's stealth in the middle or at the end so it's like here's where the stealth starts and goes or here's where the stealth starts and goes but it needs to be said that those are not core concepts it's not that your level is about that those are things that you have to do in your levels because your game requires that kind of play so the fact that there is a stealth segment is not what the level is about, because there has to be a stealth segment in every level. The fact that there is a stealth segment is simply a reward for your stealth characters, but the problem is that that reward for your stealth characters 
simply weakens the overall flow of the level because they're skipping chunks of the level. Similarly, if you're, if, you're tech, if you're a techie nerd, then generally speaking, what'll happen is there will just be random things that are tech related that you can go do tech things to, and maybe you'll get extra ammo, or maybe you'll short circuit some of the level. Either way, it's the same as stealth. What you're doing is you don't have uh, another approach that is as dense as your guns approach. Your guns approach is your primary approach, and your stealth approach and your tech approach basically just short circuit it or give you additional resources which works out from a math perspective, but it's not really very interesting from a level design perspective. And it means that all of your level design ideas are gonna be combat centric, guns centric. And you can see that by playing any Deus Ex game more modern than the first one. Their core level conceits are usually pretty gunny, but this isn't how it has to be. Let's go ahead and talk about it. If guns is your primary approach, then the basic idea is that the fee for walking around your game world from progressing for progressing from A to B is that you have to pay in bullets and health. And the player can choose, you know, how many bullets, how much health by just choosing their approach to combat. If they run in and fire one shot at point blank, they're saving bullets, but they're going to risk health. And if they stand at long range and just blow everyone down, they're going to be spending a lot of bullets, but they're going to keep all their health. So each of these tick marks is just a small fee. Bullets are health, pay up. Stealth isn't really like that because we're not used to thinking of it like that. What sort of thing would you get? What, 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 what would you pay for your stealth? Well, why not pay in footprints? As you move through the stealth area, you get into various stealth encounters, which are probably the same as these in terms of them being exactly one-to-one, -one, they're just being approached in a different way. Um, and these stealth encounters, you can get past them using stealth, but in the process, you leave clues. And that means that people are going to be more alert for you. That sounds pretty interesting, and that means that all of the techniques that we could do on the main road are also viable for stealth. So the stealth is no longer about short-circuiting the main path. It's now about doing things using a different approach, and you can balance it however you want. If you're all stealth, then you're basically gambling that you're going to be able to do this. If you're part stealth and part guns, you're sort of saying, well, if I fall out of stealth, it's no biggie. I can get back into stealth later on. It's going to be fine. Same goes with the ideas of balancing between these two. For example, when you leave footprints behind, what actually happens? Well, maybe what actually happens is that fights get removed from the main route and added to the stealth route. So every time you leave footprints, one of these fights changes routes. And that means that there might come a time when you drop out of stealth on purpose just to take that fight on as a basic combat fight with a gun real quick and easy and then back into stealth. Doesn't that sound kind of compelling? Doesn't it sound kind of interesting that the better you are at stealth, the more aggressively people will look for a stealth character to the point where it might make sense to just come out of stealth kill someone and then go back into stealth stealth is stealth failing is no longer a failure stealth failing is now a tactical maneuver and of course i've used footprints but the reality of the situation is we would need two kinds of resources um an expensive one and a cheap one or you know just two completely different related resources so that you can choose exactly how you want to do things an idea for that would be like the difference between sneaking past guards by sticking to the shadows as opposed to sneaking past guards by crawling through the vents if you stick to the shadows you won't lose any of your footprints you won't leave any footprints behind because you know there's no open vents or anything but if you do sneak by in the shadows you have a very high chance of being spotted or the guards will um, always notice you at the last second as you slip out and be like, oh, what was that? Or something. Something that costs in the long term. Maybe it's the difference between getting noticed by the security cameras versus getting noticed by actual people. Something like that. How about tech? 
Well, tech is usually just, oh, look, there's a console you want to hack. Ooh, fun. But we can do the same thing. We can have a tech path, which is exactly the same physical space as the other two paths with exactly the same challenges. But the thing would be that they would be approached in a techie way, maybe by hacking their phones and making them leave, or maybe by causing the turrets to turn against them, or maybe by opening a door that was locked so you can slip past them, or, you know, maybe by recalling them using a faked transmission. There are lots of ways that you can have hacking, teching workarounds without the tech simply being a thing that you do to get more resources and more data. For all of these, the idea is to keep the levels tight. You don't have to make three separate levels. You just make one level, and it, all that really matters is how you're approaching it, if you see what I mean. Now, this is the sort of thing where I, I don't think that this is really level design basic anymore, but I wanted to make this something clear. You can build really, really interesting and complex core play mechanics. And if you trust your players, you can actually make their interactions some of the things you're exploring, like this here. This could be the technique that we are talking about when we are doing a level. We could be making a level that is specifically about dropping out of one kind of play and into a different kind of play just to get around the side effects from our main kind of play. That could be a core mechanic. Or if you don't trust your player that much, you can use more ordinary core mechanics like flooding and unflooding the levels or like creating loops or creating more enemies if you get more treasure. Those sorts of things can all be done, but in the end, you have to keep in mind how the game is going to play. Deus Ex likes generally you can't go backwards, and that is a serious concern if you're planning to make this kind of level, because a big part of this kind of level is the price of doing business. And if you can't recharge those batteries by returning home and trying again, then the price of doing business has to be very low, which means that there's not as much challenge as you might like. And there are ways to deal with that too, but again, that's part of the core experience in your levels would be about that. In my opinion. Let me know what you think down below, um, and I'll see you around.